Hello, my name is Frank Christensen and I'm the coordinator of officials for IFAF in Europe. This is the second of seven training tapes dealing with targeting. And today we're specifically looking at players on the ground and what happens when they get hit and, and how much is targeting and, and you know, how sh should we cover this. But before we get to the game film, let's have a look to see what the rulebook and the MOFO have to say on this topic. In the rulebook, we start with a definition of a defenseless player. A defenseless player is one who, because of his physical position and focus of concentration, is especially vulnerable to injury. When in question, a player is defenseless. Examples of defenseless players include, but are not limited to, a player in the act of or just after throwing a pass, b a receiver attempting to catch a forward pass or in position to receive a backward pass, or one who has completed a catch and has not had time to protect himself or has not clearly become a ball carrier. C. A kicker in the act of or just after kicking a ball or during the kick or the return. D. A kick returner attempting to catch or recover a kick or one who has completed a catch or recovery and has not had time to protect himself or has not clearly become a ball carrier. E. A player on the ground which is also the focus of this training tape. F, a player obviously out of the play. G, a player who receives a blindside block. H, a ball carrier already in the grasp of an opponent and whose forward progress has been stopped. I, a quarterback any time after a change of possession. And finally, J, a ball carrier who has obviously given himself up and is sliding feet first. Rule 235 goes on to define targeting. It says, targeting means that a player takes aim at an opponent for purposes of attacking with forcible contact that goes beyond making a legal tackle or legal block for playing the ball. Some indicators of targeting include, but are not limited to, A, a launch. A player leaving his feet to attack an opponent by an upward and forward thrust of the body to make forcible contact in the head or neck area. B. A crouch followed by an upward and forward thrust to attack with forcible contact at the head or neck area even though one or both feet are still on the ground. C. Leading with helmet, shoulder, forearm, fist, hand or elbow to attack with forcible contact at the head or neck area. And D, lowering the head before attacking by initiating forcible contact with the crown of the helmet. In rule 913, crown of the helmet is defined. No player shall target and make forcible contact against an opponent with the crown of his helmet. The crown of the helmet is the portion of the helmet above the level of the top of the face mask. This file requires that there be at least one indicator of targeting. When in question, it is a foul. And 914 says no player shall target and make forcible contact to the head or neck area of a defenseless opponent with the helmet, forearm, hand, fist, elbow, or shoulder. This file requires that there be at least one indicator of targeting. When in question, it is a foul. In the MOFO, we go to penalty administration in the points of emphasis. 131E says, if your flag is for targeting, you must have direct verbal communication with at least one other official prior to reporting the foul to the referee. And we finish off in Penalty administration under calling fouls 1911. Number 8 says If your flag is for targeting, you must have direct verbal communication with at least one other official prior to reporting the foul to the referee. Rarely does targeting occur when there are not multiple views of the action. Because the penalty involves mandatory disqualification, we require this communication to reduce the risk of an incorrect call. And that was the book. Now, let's have a look at some game film.
On this first play, we're looking at the left tackle. So actually, the tackle on the right side of the screen. And of course, he's going to engage an opponent who's going to end up on the ground. And then he does that. Now, it's certainly enough for a, for a personal foul unnecessary roughness. I mean, it's completely unnecessary, uh, but just not quite enough. It doesn't rise to the level of a, of a targeting. Uh, he is defenseless as he's lying there on the ground. I'm just not sure that the uh, whatever force there is to the head neck area quite rises to the level of what we want for uh, for disqualification for targeting, but certainly enough for a personal foul unnecessary roughness. So if we're comparing the previous play to this one, uh, the action against the runner here, we get a good a good idea of, of what the difference is. I think here uh, we've got clear contact to the helmet uh, the runner is down so he's defenseless certainly an unnecessary hit you might even argue that this could fall under the crown of the helmet category you know sometimes uh, we get two for one but this certainly is uh, a defenseless player on the ground uh, forcible unnecessary uh, contact to his helmet and you know compared to to the last one this one certainly rises to the level of, of what we're looking for in a personal foul uh, with targeting on this last play again we're looking at the runner and you know compared to the previous one there really just isn't enough contact here I'm not even sure uh, I would have a talk to here. There's just no real contact to the head. I mean, he is down, he is defenseless, uh, but this just looks like a like a regular tackle to me, and, and, and we don't really see any, any indicator. We don't really see any forcible contact to the helmet or, or the head neck area. Uh, so in my book, this is a perfectly legal play. Uh, so that was the uh, that was the comparison between legal and illegal. I hope it made sense, and I hope you found something you can use on the field.